Good morning and welcome to today's Tom Lantos uh, Human Rights Commission hearing on hunger and the right to food in Central America. I will introduce our witnesses shortly, but would like to thank them now for their work and for taking the time to join us today. As we meet, the first ever United Nations Food System Summit is underway in New York as part of the 76th session of the UN General Assembly. As someone who has worked for many years to draw attention to the problem of global hunger, I'm thrilled that the summit is happening. The devastating consequences of widespread hunger, malnutrition, and food insecurity are finally getting the high-level attention that they deserve, as estimates of the number of hungry people in the world in 2020 have soared to as high as 811 million. Uh, while the summit uh, looks at the global situation, our focus today is on hunger and food insecurity in one region, Central America, and specifically in four countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Why Central America? One reason is solidarity. Hunger in Central America has increased almost fourfold since uh, 2018. These are neighboring countries that are reeling from the COVID pandemic, two hurricanes, and the after effects of drought. A second is pragmatic. Uh, the World Food Program has found that hunger and food insecurity are among the reasons that Central Americans are compelled into irregular migration in an attempt to better their lives, sometimes even to save them. More than 700,000 people left the Northern Triangle in fiscal year 2019, uh, with the majority bound for the United States. The number dropped dramatically the next year due to the pandemic. But this year, the numbers are increasing again. Customs of border officials apprehended or expelled more people from the Northern Triangle during the first half of fiscal year 2021 than during all of fiscal year 2020. And that's not counting those escaping the disastrous political crisis in Nicaragua. We are all aware uh, that, the, that the people fleeing north from Central America America faced great risks along the way, including kidnapping, extortion, and death. We've all seen the disturbing reports of mistreatment of migrants on both sides of the U.S. southern border, and those who enter the U.S. may not be able to regularize their status. Too often, people tragically exhaust their savings and go into deep debt for nothing. Those who do resettle abroad take their knowledge, skills, and work ethic with them, and their home countries are left worse off because of their departure. This is why it is so important to address the root causes of forced migration from Central America. Those causes are many and are interrelated, from terrible governance to climate change, food insecurity is not the only problem. But when millions of people don't have enough to eat, when malnutrition is chronic in some areas, it's clearly part of the problem. Fortunately, in Central America, we have a lot to work with in the effort to end hunger and ensure food security. First a wealth of organizations and institutions dedicated to ending hunger are working in the region. The U.S. government is a major provider of both emergency and non-emergency food assistance through programs I strongly support, including the McGovern Dole Food for Education and Child Nutrition Program, Food for Peace, both the Agricultural Development and Child Nutrition Projects of Feed the Future, and Food for Progress. More than $563 million has been provided since fiscal year 2014, with the largest share going to Guatemala. Our first panel today will discuss what programs like these uh, have, a, have what programs like these have accomplished, what has been learned, and what more can be done. Central America has also benefited from the presence of the UN World Food Program, awarded the Nobel Prize in 2020, and a clear sign of growing recognition that hunger is an obstacle to political stability. We are very pleased to have a representative from w of WFP with us today to describe the work they are doing and the lessons learned and to offer some recommendations to Congress. Some of the most creative and cost-effective efforts to combat hunger have come from the non-governmental sector, working closely with small producers and grassroots communities. We know the key role that civil society plays in the effort to transform long-standing structural obstacles to food security. On our third panel, two civil society organizations will describe their strategies to prevent, to prevent food insecurity by strengthening livelihoods and addressing market failures. Both are members of the Alliance to End Hunger, a diverse coalition of secular and faith organizations working together to fight hunger around the world. The second factor that favors the region is that the countries of Central America have all ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and the San Salvador Protocol 
uh, to the American Convention on Human Rights. That means they have formally recognized the fundamental human right to be free of hunger and to make sure that food is available, satisfies dietary needs, is safe, is culturally acceptable, and is economically and physically acceptable. It means that the governments are called upon to provide an enabling environment in which people can produce or pr procure adequate food for themselves and their families. The right to food gives us a framework for making sure we are addressing all aspects of food insecurity. Hunger is a terrible thing. As a Catholic, I was taught from an early age that feeding the hungry is an ethical imperative. As Pope Benedict affirmed in 2009, and Pope Francis has echoed, that imperative means that, and I quote, it is therefore necessary to cultivate a public conscience that considers food and access to water as universal rights of all human beings without distinction or discrimination, end quote. So for those of us uh, committed to any hunger, including all the organizations testifying today, the question is what more can we do to help the governments of Central America together with civil society meet their obligations and fulfill their citizens' right to food? And with that, I am happy, I don't know, to, to, to turn to our co-chair, uh, Congressman Smith, for any opening remarks he may have. <clears throat> Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, so again, uh, privilege to join you in, in another hearing that focuses on a, a critically important issue. As the prime house sponsor of the original Global Food Security Act, and also the prime sponsor of the subsequent reauthorization, and the lead Republican when the next reauthorization is introduced, the fight against global hunger has been in the Congress a key concern of mine uh, for over 41 years. Domestically, I have strongly supported food stamps and WIC and other vital programs. Uh, and I do believe we have a profound moral obligation to ensure uh, that people do have access to safe water uh, as well as nutritious food. In particular, I've emphasized the importance of proper nutrition during the first thousand days of life from conception to the child's second birthday. If you get that right, you reduce incidence of stunting and foster proper brain health development, which leads to healthier lives throughout the course of a lifetime. In fact, I was in Guatemala uh, when Guatemala joined the United Nations First Thousand Days Initiative called the Scaly Up Nutrition or SUN program in 2010. Guatemala still faces severe stunting problems, hope, however. So hopefully we will hear from our experts how that can uh, be better addressed. Sometimes acute food shortages require emergency food distribution, particularly in response to disasters and ongoing conflict. USAID is engaged in such efforts throughout the globe in partnership with UN entities like the World Food Program, run by the great American Executive Director David Beasley, and various other faith-based and civil society organizations, such as Catholic Relief Services and World Vision. Nonetheless, as we address these emergencies, we must keep in mind the greater goal of helping people in Central America and elsewhere gain food security via self-sufficiency in creating stable societies. I thus fully support our programs to build resiliency and promote ag-led economic development, including in Central America through the work of USAID and the Inter-American Foundation. Ultimately, mitigating misery means decreasing dependency in order to ensure human flourishing and the promotion of human dignity. And here's where I want to just raise a question with the framing of the hearing as encompassing uh, the right to food. While it may appear counterintuitive to some, the positive law concept of the right to food ultimately can be an impediment to human flourishing, and which is a threshold issue, which this hearing can and should elaborate upon. In order to do so, however, it is important to have an understanding of the major human rights instruments and the debates which played out during the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, an important landmark document and one whose spirit guides this commission in its work. The UDHR came about in the immediate aftermath of World War II, when the victorious allies sought to come up with a declaration that all parties uh, could agree to. The free countries of the West emphasized civil and political rights, in other words, negative rights, that are grounded in nature and which are held by individuals and families above and beyond the state, against which the state cannot intrude 
such as the right to life or the prior right of parents to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children per UDHR Article 26.3. Indeed, as understood by the then recent experience of the Holocaust in the Nuremberg and Tokyo war crime tribunals, which preceded the adoption of the UDHR, a totalitarian state was the great threat to the rights of individuals and therefore the rights, uh, a rights regime should serve as a check upon the power of the state. Thus, when the provisions of the non-binding UDHR were spun into, off into treaties that would be legally binding upon nations that ratified them, mere signing is not enough, rights were codified in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, a treaty which the United States has ratified and thereby chosen to be bound to. In what, in what might be euphemistically be called the socialist world, however, the rights were conceived of as being bestowed by the state or positive rights. The positive rights referenced in the UDHR, such as Article 25's right to a standard of living, adequate for health and well-being, including food, were in turn deposited into the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. The U.S. pointedly has never ratified the ICESCR. However, reasons for which our witnesses witness Bob Destro, former Assistant Secretary for Human Rights, Democracy, and Labor, might elaborate upon in his testimony. The state which grants rights, however, can also take them away or condition them as they are not grounded in nature nor exist outside and above the state. To illustrate, the Soviet Constitution of 1936, promulgated under Joseph Stalin, set forth the fundamental rights and duties of citizens in uh, Chapter 10 and contain rights which are bestowed by the state upon its citizens, though there is no explicit reference to a right to food in the 36th Constitution. In Stalin's Russia, however, the enjoyment of rights depended on the whim, the caprice of the state. Class enemies such as the Kulaks, were stripped of rights by the state and food was seized from them and other farmers for redistribution to others. In early 1930s, this policy led directly to the death of starvation uh, in the millions in Ukraine, a genocide known as the Holodomor. So much for the right to food. If nonetheless we're going to posit a right to food, it raises questions. Where does a right to food come from and how would it interact with other negative rights such as property rights? Would taking a right to food approach or, a, or more broadly adopting positive rights lead to a more just outcomes and less hunger? Or would it exacerbate conflict and lead to more hungry people? On a simple le level, if one is hungry, an apple pie cooling on the window is awfully tempting. While most people still would accept strictures against pie pilfering and uphold the property rights of pie purveyors, I think we are currently seeing an erosion of this consensus against theft sometimes justified in the name of rights, as happened in riots across the country last year. For example, in California, where statewide theft of property worth less than $950 is considered a misdemeanor, we see viral videos all the time of shoplifting that is no longer prosecuted. This lawlessness, in turn, turns leads to a withdrawal of business from that community, creating food deserts where people don't have ready access to supermarkets. On a broader level, food scarcity historically has led to migration of people with war and conflict then often following in its wake. A right to food approach where the have-nots have an entitlement to the resources of the haves could potentially exacerbate conflict and drive migration. Again, I want to emphasize, we have a moral obligation that is not easily satisfied to ensure uh, that people have access to food. But again, you know, rights are not bought. You can't walk up to a farmer and say, I want that commodity or walk into a supermarket uh, without paying. Uh, it does cost money for them to grow it, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, market it, get it to market. Uh, so it does raise some serious questions about the use of that word. But again, simultaneously, we have to do everything humanly possible to end hunger wherever and wherever it rears its ugly head. I thank you, and uh, I look forward to uh, our distinguished witnesses. Thank you very much. Um, we obviously have a different perspective, but I also want to recommend. I also want to recognize uh, that we also have on this uh, hearing uh, Congressman Jackson Lee uh, and Congressman Correa, Congressman Correa, and we welcome them uh, as well. Uh, and now, good morning. For, good morning. Um, and uh, do you want? Do you have anything to open up with, Sheila? Yep. Okay. Yep. And. Uh, 
Does Congressman Correa have any opening remarks? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much for holding this very, very timely hearing. This morning, again, I turned on the television to watch the news, and all I could see was front page pictures, discussion about the border crisis, discussion about refugee. And, you know, if we pull back and think back to history, we've watched these scenes on television for the last 40 years. This is nothing new. What makes it even worse, though, is COVID-19, the worldwide economic slowdown, has really exacerbated what we would call hunger, economic disopportunity, along with uh, narco-trafficking, terrorism, violence in Central America. And as I read a little bit more this morning into the Wall Street Journal, I'm seeing that Brazil and some of the other countries are also looking at the same situation, which is why this discussion is so imperative. We have the Western Hemisphere south of the border in a major economic crisis. And unless we act to, as you say, Mr. Chairman, stop hunger, create economic opportunity, we are looking at a major catastrophe coming down the road. And this is, again, if we talk about Democrat versus Republican, we can talk about terrorism, border security. No, folks, that's a Band-Aid over the wound. And the wound is our whole economic hemisphere is unstable. Our Secretary of State needs to be spending more time in Latin America. And we need to begin to call out those governments that's south of the border and say, you've got to respond to what your constituents need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield. Thank you. And let me go back to Ms. Jackson Lee. With her, I think we have her back on the line. You need to unmute, Sheila. I think I'm unmuted now, am I not? All set. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an important uh, briefing and presentation this morning, and I wanted to make sure that I contributed uh, my early remarks. So, Mr. Chairman, Okay, I think what we're going to do is go to our first panel because I think we're having a, a technical difficulty on, uh, on Ms. Jackson Lee's end, and we'll go come back to her. So our first panel, uh, we have Milady uh, Gilate. Uh, she serves as the direct, direct Deputy Assistant Administrator of the Bureau of Latin America and the Caribbean of the U.S. Agency for International Development (USAID). Prior to joining LAC, uh, she was the country representative for a U.S.-based nonprofit in El Salvador. And she's held several positions in the Obama Biden administration, including director at the National Security Council in the White House and a senior policy advisor and international cooperation specialist at USA at USAID. Daniel Friedman is the managing director for external and government affairs for the Inter American Foundation um, IAF. He came to the IAF after nearly 10 years with the US Department of State, where he helped manage efforts to promote peace in more than a dozen countries including Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Haiti, and Colombia. And he has worked for non-governmental organizations in Washington and Latin America. So we, we welcome our first panel, and Ms. Gilate, we will begin with you. Good morning. Co-Chairman McGovern, Co-Chairman Smith, and distinguished members of the Commission, thank you for the opportunity to testify. We are grateful for the Commission's bipartisan support for our work in the region. This topic is of particular interest to me as I began my career working on food security in East Timor in 2006. It was there as part of the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that I authored the Right to Food in Timor-Leste, the nation's first manual design with and for civil society organizations. This topic in today's hearing is an important and timely one. Food insecurity in El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua is a growing concern. The challenge has been exacerbated in the past two years by the effects of COVID-19 and natural disasters, and it's made even more acute by poor governance and corruption. 
Each country's unique context requires a tailored set of programs to adequately address this challenge. USAID is increasing our efforts in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras to make these communities more resilient, safe, and prosperous. The White House has made food security a core element in the root causes strategy and the collaborative migration management strategy. Under these strategies, USAID is providing life-saving humanitarian support and economic recovery programs to help people rebuild their livelihoods and build resilience to future shocks, and is promoting good governance as essential to all sustainable progress. I'd like to provide you just a quick overview of how USAID is making a difference in the region. In El Salvador, as many as 500,000 people are experiencing acute food insecurity. And since April of this year, USAID has provided over 16 million to meet the urgent needs of vulnerable populations and supported training in water smart agriculture to 1,000 farming families, including 500 extremely vulnerable families in Western El Salvador. And in neighboring Guatemala, where we find the highest level of chronic malnutrition in the Western Hemisphere and the sixth highest level worldwide, USAID has provided nearly 54 million in new humanitarian funding to provide life-saving assistance to more than 400,000 Guatemalans. USAID also supports smallholder farmers and agriculture dependent households to ensure inputs for planting and growing seasons to improve food security. In addition, we're addressing long-term food insecurity and increasing incomes in more than 2,500 communities in the Western Highlands through Feed the Future. We're also working with Guatemalan's private and public sector to strengthen value chains, support small and medium-sized businesses, increase incomes, and create jobs for Guatemalans. And in Honduras, where almost half of the population lives below the poverty line, USAID has provided nearly 55 million in new humanitarian assistance to food insecure households since April of this year. In addition, through Feed the Future, USAID is strengthening the sustainability of Honduras food sources, including through climate smart farming practices and diversification of crops. And in Western Honduras, Dry Corridor, USAID helps farmers increase production while building resilience to the changing climate. And lastly, Nicaragua, where a uh, result of the increasingly oppressive actions of the Ortega Murillo regime, the US government has not provided direct assistance to the government since 2012. The regime's action have continued to make Nicaragua a politically restrictive and difficult environment. Despite these limitations, USAID continues to support Nicaraguan people in their time of need. Last year, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the effects of two hurricanes, Nicaragua's food insecurity further increased with damaged crops, loss of employment, and economic opportunity, and coupled by government inaction. To help address urgent humanitarian needs, USAID is supporting multiple efforts, including nutrition, food assistance, economic recovery, and health activities. I, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission, thank you again for this opportunity to provide a quick overview of USAID's food security work in the region. Through these and other programs, USAID seeks to help the people of the region to lead healthier, more prosperous lives in their home communities. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Over. Thank you very much. Mr. Friedman. Co-chairs McGovern and Smith, distinguished commission members, thank you for calling this hearing. I am honored to share the Inter-American Foundation's work to address food insecurity in Central America and have submitted full written testimony for the record. As a U.S. agency that invests directly in community organizations helping people feed their families, we are intimately familiar with grassroots food security challenges in Central America. About 40% of our grantees are in Central America, and 55% of those directly focus on food security. Hope is at the heart of the IAF strategy in Central America. 
when people can't feed their children and lose hope for a future in their home countries. They project their hopes onto migrating to places where they believe they can survive. Our grantees instill hope by showing people their communities can change for the better, that their children's lives can be better than their own. Food insecurity, a critical issue in Central America for decades, has been exacerbated by recent events. The COVID-19 pandemic cut off production and access to markets, destroying livelihoods and disrupting supply chains. Food prices increased significantly. Many were forced to eat fewer meals per day. Central American communities then lost crops, electricity, and drinkable water following two consecutive Category 4 hurricanes in November 2020. The overwhelming majority of our grantees and their communities in Honduras, Guatemala, and Nicaragua were impacted. We are already hearing reports of increased regional outmigration due to these disasters. Congress founded the Inter-American Foundation in 1969 to propel people's efforts to make their own communities in Latin America and the Caribbean more prosperous, peaceful, and democratic. Our distinct bottom-up model promotes inclusion, ownership, and sustainability by awarding small grants for innovative community-led proposals from grassroots organizations. Grantees match IAF investment with local cash or in-kind resources. Today, the IAF's active portfolio includes over 375 community-led projects in 26 countries. The demand for grants addressing food security from across Latin America and the Caribbean increased by 75% from 2018 to 2020. We increased our funding to bring our, our total food security portfolio to $59 million. Unfortunately, that still left nearly 27 million in viable food security proposals unfunded in 2020. In Central America, we fund 153 grants to local organizations valued at $101.9 million, which includes co-investment from grantees. The IAF strategy in the region hinges first on strengthening people's resilience by promoting sustainable agriculture, food security, and disaster preparedness. And second, on fostering rootedness by intensifying their local ties and addressing the numerous factors making life untenable for Central Americans. Many grantees promote, pursue multiple strategies at once, such as improving livelihoods and creating enterprises, encouraging participation and confidence in transparent democratic processes, and promoting strategies to prevent violence and protect human rights. I would like to share three time-tested approaches used by local IAF grantees to give Central Americans hope for a future free from hunger. We have shared these across the global food security interagency. The first is to invest in community-led crisis response and resilience. Our experience has shown that local organizations rooted in the communities they serve are often best positioned to identify and address acute food insecurity in crisis settings. While we are not a humanitarian aid agency, in response to recent crises, we quickly provided grantees with additional flexibility and funding. Three quarters of grantees used this disaster recovery funding to improve immediate food security and lay groundwork for addressing longer term needs. We also invest in local capacity to anticipate and mitigate food security impacts by developing inclusive disaster mitigation plans, improving water storage, creating seed banks, and diversifying food production. The second lesson is to tackle food security comprehensively. IAF grantees reduce hunger on multiple fronts at once by making food more available for consumption and sale by improving sustainable production and resource management, making food more accessible by strengthening local markets, distribution systems, and food storage, as well as increasing families' food purchasing power, and making diets more adequate by training communities in nutrition and diversifying diets. Our third lesson is uh, to strengthen community support networks that enhance food security. For example, IAF supported community savings and loans associations provided capital to farmers for supplies to replant and rebuild after the hurricanes. I wanna close with one particularly moving example of how IAF grantees convert despair to hope. Remarkably, youth have been returning from nearby cities to drought-stricken rural parts of Francisco Morazan in Honduras, a high out migration area. Young people have resettled there because they see fresh potential in agriculture thanks to an IAF grantee's success in improving access to water. While this trend is new, it shows youth can envision a good life in Honduras. That is what hope can do. I would like to thank Congress for its ongoing bipartisan support of our work in Central America and the Commission for inviting me to appear today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, ask, this is a question for both of you. Um, can you tell me uh, what role does corruption play in food insecurity and, and how might the Biden-Harris administration's focus on rooting out corruption uh, and improving transparency also improve the environment for addressing root causes of migration like food insecurity? 
Um, thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Um, corruption, as I, as I mentioned in my report, in my remarks, um, it's, it's a cross cutting thing through everything that we do, not just food security, uh, but really in, in every aspect, uh, whether it's health, education, um, the root cause of strategy has made governance, rule of law, and human rights a core element of, of having any type of impact or positive effect in the region. So if we want to address the root causes to migration and want to address food security, corruption has to be, uh, it's first among equals. So one clear example um, how we've been able to to send a strong message and follow through with actions is through, I'll give you an example in El Salvador at May 1st, institutions that were undermined by President Bukele, um, which were undemocratic, unconstitutional, USAID decided to redirect our funds from those institutions to civil society. Civil societies that work specifically on anti-corruption efforts, uh, not just in El Salvador, but are part of regional networks. So we're looking at providing more support to civil society because we think that's where the best investment is to tackle corruption. And as part of the root causes strategy before it was launched uh, six weeks ago, we did an extensive consultation process, not only with NGOs in, in all three countries, but also here uh, in, in, in the US, whether it was faith-based organizations and all of them had the same concern. So we really wanted to take a, a look at what worked and what didn't work in the last four years, also um, from the last Central America strategy, so that we don't make the same mistakes. But we found that one common thread is that civil society will be at the forefront of this battle, right? We can't do it alone. Um, and, and that's um, you know one key example of, of how we're approaching um, this um, this really you know horrible uh, conditions for Salvadorians and, and all of them throughout Central America. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. Thank you, and I agree with my colleagues' comments. It's certainly a rising concern across the region, and it's why it's so important for the IAF that we work to strengthen local civil society that are ultimately going to hold their governments to account. Uh, the IAF does not work with government actors at any level. We work exclusively with grassroots civil society organizations. Organizational capacity building is a key component of all of our work in the region. Um, and many of our grantees work directly to tackle corruption, to promote transparency, and to promote government oversight. Just as a brief example, in Honduras, one IAF grantee partner that has been um, training youth leaders, they've trained more than 10,000 youth leaders, uh, total have been trained as a result of this pro project. Um, they've started shifting to focus exclusively on things, or focus specifically on anti-corruption work, uh, transparency, oversight of uh, government work, and they're beginning to see results as a re uh, uh, from that work. They've um, reported that they've seen increased spending on schools and education from municipal governments, and specifically after the hurricane, they were able to quickly pivot to oversee the use of um, hurricane relief funds and ensure it actually went to the immediate assistance that was, re that was required. Thank you. Let me let me ask uh, both of you. In Guatemala, studies show the Guatemalan government has invested proportionally less in programs benefiting indigenous people compared compared with non-indigenous populations. How are USAID and IAF supporting indigenous communities that suffer a disproportionately higher rate of malnutrition and continue to endure a long history of social, political, and economic marginalization? And discrimination, and how can Congress further support these efforts? Um, thank you, Congressman. Oh. Go ahead. Um, so, the Western Highlands in in Guatemala, and, and also in the context of migration, and how that is also uh, a huge factor in, in having. Um, we have we have data that demonstrates why more people flee from the Western Highlands. With the indigenous population, and it's because they're reliant on agriculture. USAID has specifically focused projects in the Western Highlands that address not only the needs of, of, um, of indigenous population, but it's specifically youth and women uh, in the Western Highlands. We have adapted our programs um, to have market analysis done to, 
to make sure that we're attending to the needs of the populations, uh, whether through education, ensuring that all of our, our materials are done in the various um, indigenous languages. Um, so there's the adaptability piece. Um, our Feed the Future project, specifically in Guatemala, focus on municipal government. Um, and, and looking at the, the sustainability to expand and improve the essential services that are provided uh, to the community. Um, from community hygiene to education for women and girls and economic opportunities and resilience. Just uh, three months ago, we launched a center in the Western Highlands, which is going to be one of three called Campo. And Campo looks at how you diversify crops. So populations are not just relying on one crop, but how to diversify them, how to link them to um, private sector, and not only from the US, but also from the region. So really having a comprehensive and organic approach to providing support on food security to the indigenous population in the Western Highlands. So that's, that's definitely uh, one key way that we're making progress. We launched the, the Campo Center uh, four months ago, and there's two more in, in the next six months. Over. Mr. Freeman. Yes, thank you. The Western Highlands is also a priority area for the IAF um, uh, and across the Latin America and Caribbean region. Uh, nearly a full third of our grantee partners represent and work with uh, indigenous communities specifically. Um, we've had particular success um, when utilizing local agricultural production techniques um, and traditional agricultural production techniques. Um, one grantee partner in the Western Highlands has um, uh, trained nearly a thousand farmers in methods of collecting native seeds, adopting natural insect repellents and biofertilizer and harvesting rainwater, which has greatly increased the, the um, availability of food in the region. We also, our grantee partners work to uh, connect uh, indigenous producers to international markets. Um, one of our uh, grantee partners in the Western Highlands um, is a Guatemalan foundation that has managed to connect uh, cacao farmers to um, uh, US based boutique chocolate companies. One of these actually just won um, a gold medal from the London Academy of Chocolate and helps them reach international markets. So in addition to being able to grow more of their own food, they're also able to supplement their incomes with um, cash crops for other basic for other important needs. Thank you. Look at many small producers are women uh, and women often become heads of households when they when their partners migrate. So can you describe how your programs address the differential needs of women? And um, and just one final thing. And, and then after you answer, I'll turn to Mr. Smith. What is the food security situation of Afro uh, descended communities in the regions and, and how do your programs take into account the needs of those communities? Why don't we, uh, Ms. Gilarte, do you want to go first? Sure, thank you, uh, Congressman. Um, the Afro-descendant communities in Honduras has been uh, a focus as well for us in our food security programming. Uh, as you pointed out, they are the most vulnerable in, um, in the, especially the coastal areas uh, of Honduras. Uh, their specific focus on ensuring that we provide education to, to young women, but also that the em employment opportunities for these Afro-descendant women um, attain, um, support and respond to their needs. So if, they, if they're the main uh, breadwinner, uh, how can we provide work opportunities that they can bring their kids to work? Um, looking for, we look for companies that also um, have labor rights that are in terms of um, social corporate responsibilities. So vetting all those companies that ensure that we have the right protection systems for women and, and young uh, and youth, um, it's one of the ways that we uh, we support the Afro-descendants in, in Honduras. And what about on, on women? Uh, women at, at large, you mean, or uh, yeah, well, Afro-descendants? You know, I mean, um... I mean, how do your programs address the differential needs of women? Um, I mean, as I said, I mean, women often becomes become heads heads of households when their when their partners migrate. Um, and so, your programs address that at all? 
Yes. Um, in fact, uh, through our IOM partner, which is um, one of our main partners in the region, the data that's collected through our IOM partners, in addition to custom border patrol, as we zoom in on the migration you know, um, aspect on who flees and why, we try to um, identify the communities of high out migration and what are the needs ones that say that male, which tend to migrate at higher uh, proportions leave. What happens to the women, right? In most cases, um, gender-based violence is also another reason uh, why there's why women flee. Uh, I think the data shows that one out of three uh, women flee because of gender-based violence. So. When the woman is left, um, you know, head of household, we do provide um, specifically on, on humanitarian assistance through cash transfer programs. That's definitely one way that we're looking at it from the short term, uh, providing vouchers and cash transfer programs, to doing market analysis as well to make sure that they are able not just to buy the food that is, you know, appropriate and, and, um, and to, you know, the cultural context, but also that they have um, for soap, uh, you know, uh, different uh, needs that they may have. Um, but again, it's really targeted uh, based on the data that we've been getting from um, our IOM partners. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. Yes, thank you for that question, Congressman. Um, uh, nearly 20% of our grantee partners um, are uh, work with Afro descendant communities. Uh, they work specifically to um, train Afro-descendant communities um, uh, to pulse production from community gardens to help supplement diets, uh, various forms of income generation, and also support to fishing associations, which can both increase livelihoods as well as increase food security. Um, across our portfolio, uh, women comprise more than half of the participants in IAF programs. As you mentioned, there are oftentimes specific needs um, as well as specific benefits that women and specifically women heads of household are able to bring to their communities and to their families. So across the region, we see IAF grantee partners supporting women entrepreneurs to expand their businesses, um, associations of women that are better able to um, engage with local governments to uh, describe the policies that would best meet their needs and other methods to help support women who are providing for their family and for their communities. Thank you both very much. I want to turn over to Mr. Smith for any questions he may have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for your testimonies and for your leadership uh, and for your answers to those uh, questions. I, uh, I have a number of questions and I'll pose them as quickly as I can. Um, you know, uh, in the early 1980s, I traveled like other members who were here then or staff members like my good friend Jim McGovern uh, to El Salvador to the other Central American countries. And, and one of the big emphasis that I had was on uh, the child survival revolution and the importance of vaccinations and the importance as well of oral rehydration therapy as a way of mitigating the effects of diarrheal disease, which is one of the leading killers of children. Uh, and along with that is, uh, you know, global food security or food security uh, is absolutely linked to that because if you, if you can't hold down a, a meal uh, and you have multiple bouts that end up dying or being debilitated, um, you know, what good is the food? You can't, yeah. So I'm wondering how integrated to this day, um, uh, Ms. Gallardi, maybe you might want to speak to this, are our programs with ORT, which uh, is a absolute lifesaver, as you know. I actually authored uh, the amendment to save the child survival uh, um, uh, uh, program. Uh, it was slated to, to be done away with um, by uh, uh, early days of the Reagan administration. I not only reauthorized it, I doubled the amount of money for it uh, and saw the effects. I went down during days of tranquility with the FMLN uh, in El Salvador, for example, on a, two occasions uh, when the only shots heard those days were the shots to uh, to deal with um, um, you know, the five leading killers of children uh, or five of them, uh, including the polio drops. It was just amazing to see uh, how life could be enhanced uh, through a simple inter and very, very inexpensive intervention. Uh, but it, uh, I remember being down there uh, in El Salvador as well uh, with the uh, Knights of Malta because uh, they were providing food uh, to people and medicines who were at great risk of, of starvation and malnutrition. Uh, so, you know, it's been a long, you know, effort uh, for all of us. Uh, I've always been 
deeply impressed with both the civil and the faith-based community efforts uh, there. Uh, so you might want to speak again, if you could, to how well things like child survival are incorporated. Secondly, um, and, and, and oral re rehydration. Uh, secondly, on the issue of the first thousand days, which I mentioned, uh, like I said, I was in Guatemala when on the day they announced that I was at the parliament uh, and was was greatly touched by, you know, the initiatives. Uh, I've been pushing it ever since all over the world, including in Africa, uh, Nigeria, where we probably have the greatest number of, of stunting events uh, uh, attributable to a, a lack of nutritious foods and supplementation. And, and if you could just speak to that, how well are these, both of you, uh, are these countries, including Guatemala, which signed up for the UN program, uh, doing on, on incorporating, you know, the proper nutrition uh, so that especially those who are impoverished, uh, those moms, you know, if you don't do it during the um, uh, in utero period, which is why it is from conception to the second birthday, uh, much of the good is it doesn't start at birth. You've got to do it while the child is an unborn child. Equally important, and I chair the Autism Caucus here in the House. Um, I've written four laws on autism, including the original and the most recent called Autism Cares. And IAC over it, uh, which is a, a interagency organization with a lot of stakeholders run by the US government. They put out a lot of research, you know, NIH, uh, and CDC all collaborate. And one of the big takeaways is how important folic acid is uh, to mitigating autism. And the experts tell us there are a number of peer reviewed studies that if it is done early, either before the woman becomes pregnant or in the first or second months, then it has its um, very, very significant impact. One study showed a 40% uh, decrease in autism uh, if folic acid is provided during uh, that time uh, in a woman's pregnancy. Uh, and I'm wondering how, if that's being done with folic acid, and of course the UN has a, an initiative on that as well. We do too, uh, we push it. Uh, and maybe you could uh, speak to that. Uh, also, so um, on one question would be on CAFTA. Uh, you know, I remember I went down to El Salvador when the, um, and met with a number of stakeholders, including the Catholic Church, uh, with regards to CAFTA. Uh, I ended up voting no, because I felt it would have a, do some significant injury to uh, small farmers uh, and others. And that was one of the takeaways. Big farmers may do well, but the little farmers would be uh, injured. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if that, you know, I've, I've read studies, you know, one of them was done by the University of Florida, um, and it was, a, you know, and they underscored the fact that the small farmer would uh, be injured. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could speak to that as well. Uh, and are there any changes we might um, contemplate uh, to, again, uh, get to a place where uh, they are self-sustaining? Yes, of course, on an emergency basis, always whatever is needed, those foods and, and, and the like medicines need to be need to flow. But of course, you want to uh, uh, get to a point where they are self-sustaining. And uh, I'm just wondering if CAFTA had a positive or a negative impact uh, on food insecurity in Central America. Thank you, Congressman. I uh, really appreciate the questions and, and your rich background and experience and contributions you, you've made on the region. I will not uh, pretend that I have all the answers for you right now because I, I honestly think um, it requires a more thorough response than what I can provide right now. Um, so happy to be, you know provide a follow up once I, I get more information from my Definitely. colleagues, but I, I can definitely uh, provide my initial reaction on starting with your last point on on the impacts of CAFTA. I agree that we uh, have seen a mix um, mixed impact right of both positive and negative. When you look at CAFTA um, from a, a regional perspective, you know, you have multiple countries, instability for different reasons, um, whether it's governance, uh, now COVID, um, border protection. We have seen that due to transportation costs, um, you know, corruption, again, is really behind a, a lot of um, some of the difficulties of getting uh, food across borders in the region and how different countries respond. Um, and, and this is something that uh, the administration is taking a close look uh, about how can we optimize CAFTA to better provide for those that need it most, right? Because I, I think that that's really at the core of, of why CAFTA was created as well. Um, but I agree with you, there has been mixed results. And, and I think it's 
one of the many tools in the toolbox that we have now to leverage what how we could improve the conditions uh, in Central America. So CAFTA, without a doubt, is a, a topic of discussion in the interagency right now. Also, how it's going to impact uh, addressing root causes uh, of migration in the region. But I uh, just wanted to, to acknowledge and, and let you know that we are um, looking at, at CAFTA more closely and, and how it could be used and utilized in a, a more positive uh, fashion. In terms of folic acid, I, I cannot uh, speak to it. Uh, I have not come across, uh, at least not in my uh, tenure uh, at USAID right now, that we have investments in this area, as well as autism. Uh, perhaps my colleagues from the Bureau of Health, uh, Health Bureau um, may have examples, but I do not have those right now. So I'll make sure to follow up with you uh, on that point. Um, in terms of impacts on the previous programs that you mentioned, I do want to say that in Guatemala, uh, we have seen that there's been a 28% um, decrease of household um, that have been affected by hunger severely. So I, I think that is a positive example that, that we can directly link to, to the programs you mentioned. So specifically in the communities where we have the type of assistance, we've seen a reduction of 28%. So I think that's very positive. And again, I can let you know which communities and, and how um, uh, the numbers demonstrate that over time uh, we had success. And in Honduras, uh, the participants that participated in, in those activities to have doubled their income over the life of the project. So again, I, I think there are two clear uh, examples of success in Honduras and Guatemala um, linked to, to the programs that you mentioned. So again, happy to uh, have yeah, more. For yeah, we, you. we ought to get back and, and talk for because that first thousand days. Um, every time I talk to a foreign leader, or, or members of their parliament uh, or Congress, uh, I give them the data, and it's 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 so compelling how the right nutritious and you know it better than anybody. How you know by making sure that that food is available, especially during uh, the woman's uh, first two months of that pregnancy, it just but if, but throughout, of course, uh, in the first. You know, what, uh, you know, up, up until the second birthday, it's just first thousand days makes an enormous impact. And um, if there's anything you can get back to us on with regards to uh, Guatemala, uh, because they've had it now for over ten years, um, the program to see, you know, if it's uh, yes, is it if they continued their aggressive approach or because they were very high on the idea. And just one thing on the Global Food Security Act. Uh, again, I sponsored it. Um, uh, Betty McCollum was our chief co-sponsor. And we'll flip, and she'll be the prime sponsor this year. Uh, Senator Casey also was the Senate sponsor. Um, um, we put a very heavy emphasis on women and inclusiveness of women into into um, you know, the whole food uh, farmers and everything else. And I'm just wondering how that has uh, played out because that was <clears throat> not just aspirational in the bill. You know, we really try to make sure that that you know women really are at the table, fully participating. Uh, in in their economies as it relates to ag everywhere else too, but but that was a food security bill. So, um, thank you. If you could just keep that in mind, because that that's you know, absolutely partisanship on that one, and by Carol, strong support. That's what we need. Thank you. We'll do. And thank you for those uh, those questions, uh, Representative, um, uh, and as well as for your ongoing support for this work. Um, just to respond to a couple of the points that you raised, um, I can't speak specifically to the role of oral rehydration therapy, but it certainly speaks to the importance of access for clean water, which is yes. in a tied to that. And that's uh, an issue that our grantee partners are working very closely on and have oftentimes managed to use, especially in what's known as the dry corridor of Central America, a number of really innovative and low tech solutions to increase access, not only to the quantity of water, but also to the quality of clean water. One of our grantee partners actually um, has begun using a design that was first um, developed in Sub-Saharan Africa known as sand dams, which is just a very low cost way of being able to extend access to water for three to five months each year, which also has the, uh, helps to filter that water in the process to give communities better access to clean water. Um, in terms of uh, childhood nutrition, first 1,000 days, I defer to, to state and aid in terms of how governments are helping to address this. The IAF works exclusively with non-governmental organizations, but this is something that we do see grassroots organizations working actively on. 
um, both to increase the, the quantity of food, but also the quality, which is certainly as important for, for childhood development is getting that those balances. So um, just highlight one example from Guatemala, a faith-based organization that we work with um, supports child nutrition and health um, through uh, training families on ways to grow um, uh, and supplement their diets through family gardens. And it, in addition to increasing the amount of food, provides a wider range of um, of nutrients that are available. And just through their their work alone, we've seen more than a thousand school children gain weight uh, over the life of this project. Thank you very much, Mr. Freeman. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions, Ms. Ms. Jackson Lee? Yes. Yeah, any oh, questions? Or, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Trying to. Uh... Okay, you're, you're on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there you. you go. All right. Mr. Chairman, again, thank you very much for this uh, very important hearing. And thank you to the witnesses uh, that are here. Uh, let me say that I was uh, in my district and uh, speaking to a recent uh, immigrant, and uh, they were telling the story of their journey to the United States and their affection for this country. Uh, and they're reminded of the time of uh, where they came from, uh, being hungry or uh, having to be dependent. Uh, and food came to their village or their town, and they came to get it. Uh, and as they looked down on the large bag of rice, they saw the United States of America. Food is life-saving. Uh, food generates the ability of the world to work together. And hunger, in contrast, is divisive, sees violence, uh, and gives us not a bright future for our children. Uh, I have co-sponsored any number of legislative issues dealing with uh, emphasizing the importance of our children. I've emphasized that immigrant women victims of domestic violence should not be denied uh, those benefits that would include food benefits. I remember being in Guatemala on the vitamin D project, going into the mountains and looking at children who are not only deprived of good healthy food, but obviously vitamin D, and looking at the results of that deficiency. Uh, food can undermine the future of a nation. So I think these are important discussions. The United Nations is having an important discussion. Food generates migration. Migration in some instances generates uh, fear and violence and intimidation. The United States of America has poverty. Uh, we want to end hunger in America as we know it. We're not there yet. But Americans are spoiled to the extent of having to be part of in this 20th and 21st century migrations of the proportions that we've seen in Central America and what we're seeing now with the Haitian migrants. I think that we are less apt to think of food as diplomacy and part of the political core of the world. We are all in the last couple of days, and I'd be remiss if I did not speak to it as a Texan, uh, as an African-American uh, as an officer of the executive board of the Congressional Black Caucus, those unbelievable and unspeakable sites against Haitian migrants, Rio Grande, my state, the border, where over 1,000, 1,900 miles exist as a southern border where we have lived harmoniously, where right now today, people are entering the border in many different legal entry, legally, responsibly, it is secure. It is not an open border, but the United States is a place of refuge. And the fact that Haitian migrants are fleeing because the conditions in the Northern Triangle would cause them to keep moving. The conditions in other South American countries cause them to be pushed out. And part of it, of course, is the ability to live. It would be the right 
compliment if we could look to the Caribbean and South and Central America to be able to work together on this massive migration. But food plays a major part. And when you find the Northern Triangle still struggling to feed its people, and governments that are oppressive and not being responsive, then we have that cataclysmic and ridiculous, that word probably does not craft it correctly, but sad and tragic collapse and catastrophic impact. So I wanted to look at food in that context, ask this uh, question as we look to the root causes of migration and food insecurity and the right of food in Central America, we cannot help but think of the Caribbean, not help think of Haiti, Haitian migrants, uh, cannot help of finding a better way uh, to uh, work with our administration on solutions. Because we cannot buy into the narrative that is so often posed by our friends on the other side of the aisle, how dastardly migrants are and devastating and they're attacking our border. And have you seen what's happening at the Southern border? Have you seen what's happening at the Northern border in 2000 terrorists attempted to come uh, at the turn of the century? Have you seen on the other hand, families on uh, one side of the Northern border and the other side wanting to see each other and asking for the restrictions to be uh, removed in the light of COVID? The borders are important lifelines of our countries. People flee to eat, to avoid sexual exploitation, to avoid the devastation of their children, to avoid murder and mayhem, and to avoid devastating hunger. So I would appreciate it um, to Deputy Assistant Administrator Giliark. Am I almost correct? And and uh, the other witnesses to answer the question uh, of the um, intersectionalism of these issues of hunger and danger and migration and how we should be uh, directly um, sensitive to making this a priority, but, but the elements that we should use to do so. And I'd appreciate it uh, if you would add uh, the uh, devastating um, choices that Haitian migrants had to make in making their way from South, in this instance, from South and Central America to the U.S. border. Your thoughts about that, please. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I, uh, I am an immigrant myself. I uh, came at an early age and really benefited from the program's uh, social safety nets that this program, th this country uh, allowed my family and I um, to benefit from early on, including food stamps. So I, I grew up close to a, a Haitian community. So understanding the context and the hardships of, of, you know, the countries where many are fleeing from is something that's very personal to me. Um, I can, um, I can confirm that this administration is doing a very holistic and genuine effort to ensure that we have all the tools that are needed to address the root causes of migration. In addition to having uh, a, a legal pathways um, um, through a, a legal pathway system through the collaborative migration management strategy, um, we're not looking at it just where the only um, we're the only ones in the region that can make a difference, but we're looking at internationalizing it. How do we look at other partners in the world to ensure that they're complementing our efforts, right? So it's not just the US government coming in and providing assistance and, and because it's needed and because our, our neighbors um, need all the support that they can, but looking at how can other donors support and complement the activities that we do? We have from Argentina to Chile, to Mexico, in fact, we just signed um, an MOU with Mexico's development agency. There's two flagship programs called Sembrando Vida and Jóvenes Construyendo that really focus on providing food security to the most vulnerable. So through this partnership, we're launching 
um, these types of efforts in Central America. We've traveled together with our Mexican counterparts to Central America to see how we can um, expand and optimize these programs in the region. We're, we're looking at providing um, support through cash transfer, uh, although there are mixed, um, mixed data that demonstrates that having cash transfers does not um, does not propel more migration or less, but at least is an assistance that can be provided in the short to medium term while we also look at all the other instruments we have, engaging the private sector and also asking the governments to be accountable and responsible, right? Corruption, again, is key. Just yesterday, there was a, an article about officials in El Salvador that have taken advantage of food distribution to get their pockets full, right? Um, so now there's a case in the attorney general's office in one of uh, Bukele's cabinet members. There's also implications in Honduras, right? With the government uh, mismanagement of funds uh, for COVID and, and food assistance. So again, it's pushing governments and not pushing, I'm sorry, but working with governments to ensure that they're responding to the needs of their population. And it's a relationship that it's one on equal footing and not just charity that you know us taxpayers are providing to to our partners in the region but for them to also do their part and be accountable so again it's working with civil society so they can demand uh those rights from from their own governments um but i'll, I'll let my colleague uh, daniel daniel as you answer thank you so very much as you answer please include, include my comments about haitian migration thank you thank you for that question congresswoman um you spoke to the intersection of um, food security and migration. Um, that's definitely something that we observe. We see many overlapping factors that both drive migration as well as worsening food security. Um, it's difficult to expand opportunities and livelihoods um, for, for children um, when, uh, sorry, to expand um, educational opportunity that's required to increase food security when there's not access to education. And similarly, it's difficult for students to learn when they're hungry. 70% um, of our grantee partners work in areas that have a presence of gangs or criminal groups, um, which certainly worsens food security when local businesses or producers are extorted or when people are not able to get the supplies or equipment that they need for their family farms because it requires crossing through different gang lines. Um, so for this reason, our grants uh, work to promote rootedness and resilience in multiple different ways at once um, to address food security, but to also help to grow local enterprises, to provide scholarships, to enhance education, to prevent violence, to promote human rights, and also to promote civic engagement and fight corruption. Um, I also really appreciate uh, your calling attention to the situation in Haiti. It is indeed dire for the IAF. Haiti is one of our priority countries. We have nearly $11 million um, in projects there, and about half of those are addressing food security specifically, but the challenges have been severe and increasingly so. Um, three of our grantee organizations that serve um, 150,000 patients in remote and rural areas uh, were deeply impacted by the recent uh, earthquakes. Um, we're hearing reports of people in need of shelter, water, food, and medicines. Um, so we're right now working with our grantee partners to help them adjust their programming to provide supplemental funds as needed to help meet more of these needs. But as you referenced, the situation itself is quite dire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will look forward to pursuing the uh, line of questioning after the other panelists uh, uh, regarding my theory on Haitian migration. Thank you so very much. It is tied to uh, the uh, theme and the importance of this right. hearing. Thank you again. Thank I yield you back. Thank you very much. I don't see anyone else on uh, at, uh, looking to be recognized for questions. So I want to thank the panelists for being with us. Thank you for your excellent testimony. Thank you for being responsive. And we will we will follow up with you in writing uh, if there are additional questions. We now go to our second panel. Uh, we welcome Valerie Newsom, Newsom uh, Gwen, Gwenary, who serves as the Assistant Executive Director at the World Food Program. She spearheads WFP's humanitarian and development efforts to ensure protection and inclusion expand school meals and uh, nutrition programs, empower women, foster innovation, build resilient food systems, and support cash transfers and social protection. Before WFP, she worked in the, uh, in the U.S. government as the national security, uh, at the National Security Council and the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID. 
Uh, we welcome her here today. Thank you so much. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Chairman McGovern. Thank you, Chairman Smith, distinguished members. Thank you for the invitation to provide testimony to this committee. The World Food Program is the largest humanitarian organization fighting hunger in more than 80 countries around the work. And the work that we do is only possible thanks to the generosity of the American people and to the support of Congress and the US Agency for International Development. In our work, we are facing the interconnected problems of hunger, insecurity, and migration as a daily reality. And we see how the climate crisis is combining with conflict and now COVID's economic impact to deepen hunger and make our work harder. And as our executive director, David Beasley, has been highlighting, these factors have plunged 300 million more people into hunger and food insecurity. And without stepped up action and support, we risk the hunger pandemic following in the wake of the global health pandemic. Central America, the topic of today's conversation, has been experiencing late rains and droughts interspersed with excessive rains and severe storms, flooding, and landslides. I traveled to Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador in May and June, and I was able to see and hear firsthand how hurricanes Eta and Iota delivered a one-two punch in November 2020 that has really put people who are already struggling into a deeper struggle, not just because of the direct impacts of the storm, but how the storms came on top of and worsened pre-existing social stresses, tensions, and inequalities. According to our projections, over the last five years, more than 2 million people left their homes in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua in the hope of a better life elsewhere and 80% of that movement headed to the US. There are now 8 million food insecure people in Central America, almost four times the number that there were in 2018. And according to WFP surveys, roughly half of the food insecure people in these countries want to migrate to the United States, almost double the rate as compared with the more food secure parts of the population. And economic reasons such as low wages, unemployment, and insufficient income to meet food and other basic necessities are both the driving factor to leave, but also the major impediment for starting the migration journey or doing it safely and legally. Many of these problems are familiar to the region and they have a long history of migration, but sudden climate shocks can be the tipping point that pushes people who are reliant on marginal lands and marginal livelihoods over the edge. And so in connecting the dots between climate, migration, and food security, today's Food Systems Summit that's happening on the margins of the UN General Assembly and President Biden's executive order in February on climate change and migration together present a pivotal moment in the broader discourse on food security. Too often, we've seen the global humanitarian and development systems working in disparate and disconnected ways. And the default response has been to reduce the phenomenon of migration to a matter of economics or security. Instead, we need to better understand the complex reality that drives people to leave their homes and take concrete action to address those root causes. At the World Food Program, we recognize the link between food insecurity and migration, and we have a suite of successful programs in Central America that increase access to nutritious food, generate employment, build resilience, and support school children. We provide food vouchers and cash to buy food for people so people can buy food. And last year we reached 750,000 people affected by the tropical storms and hurricanes Eta and Iota and received USAID support for this work. We're working with the private sector, other UN partners like the International Organization on Migration and the governments to support youth and returnees with job trainings, internships and job opportunities. We take a special focus on women and helping women develop the basic digital technical skills they need, like training as chefs in gastronomy or in hospitality management, entrepreneurship, among other areas. 
We provide nutrition. We work through national systems to ensure that mothers and children receive that essential nutrition that they need for a healthy life and fully agreeing with, uh, with, with, with Congressman Smith on the essential importance of the first thousand days. And we support governments to provide school meals for children, because it's not just the first thousand days, it's the 8,000 days so that we can also make sure that children benefit from that throughout their life cycle while sourcing food locally from small farmers so that we can make that market connection, ensuring an outlet for local produce and increasing farmer income. Right now, WFP is supporting 2 million people in the dry corridor of Central America. But we have the potential to scale up to 8 million people in light of the growing need, and we've priced that at $1.7 billion. Our work with government and communities in these countries helps give people a reason to stay, feed their families, and invest in a better future. Now, all the programs I've highlighted has something in common, and that's that it puts people, their needs and aspirations at the center. And this is the essential condition in our view for success. If we're to create a sustainable remedy to the interconnected problems of hunger and migration, we need to support people to enjoy their rights, to build their livelihoods, and ultimately hold governments accountable to respect, protect, and enable them to fulfill their rights. Placing rights at the center of our work means developing programs built on the idea of access to food and to means of production and livelihoods. Without the ability to feed themselves and their families and build livelihoods in their homelands, the migrant flows and the headlines about caravans will roll on and they're undoubtedly going to get worse. At WFP, we recognize that the people we serve play a critical role in identifying and solving the problems they face. To help people, we must listen to them, understand their needs, aspirations, and concerns, and work with them to achieve them. We must first address hunger if we're to address the interconnected problems of climate and migration, but we have to do it the right way, and this requires putting rights, accountability, and people at the center of our work. Thank you for your engagement, and I look forward to your questions. Um, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your testimony. Um, let me uh, let me ask you. Um, uh, how, how can school meal programs integrate local producers to support both adequate nutrition uh, for school, school aged children and a level of economic well being for local producers. Well, we have been uh, participating over the years and have built a, a, a great experience by engaging in the McGovern Dole School Meals Program, feeding children around the world and using U.S. produce in order to do that. And over time, there we have introduced a, a window within that program that's also allowed us to buy food locally. And by using and exploiting that window and getting other donors and governments themselves to support, what we're increasingly um, advocating and putting forward is a homegrown school meals approach where school meals programs are sourced from produce grown locally uh, by smallholder farmers. And this allows the opportunity to introduce more diverse diets into the school meals program, more fresh foods into the school field a meals program and really provide both a healthy, a healthier and a tastier meal for school children. And, and that's why today, one of the big initiatives at the uh, Food Systems Summit is the launch of the School Meals Coalition, which the US is one of the champions of. And it's really recognizing that school meals are a solution, a game changing solution for food systems, helping small farmers and communities, helping give children that best start to life in a better future, engaging communities and supporting the child and supporting the schools. It's really a win-win-win situation. No, and I, uh, and I appreciate your highlighting the McGovern Dole program, which is something that I care very deeply about. Um, and, um, and I've visited many of these programs and, um, you know, and as you, I mean, the benefits are in addition to making sure that kids have adequate nutrition, it's getting kids into schools. It's getting girls into schools, um, girls with an education are less likely to get married at an earlier age or less likely to have as many children. I mean, it's 
it deals with a whole bunch of challenges. Kids in school um, getting nutrition means they'll be literate. Um, and countries, you know, with populations that have a high rate of illiteracy have a more difficult time developing. So it's all, I mean, there's incredible benefits to to uh, to that. Um, in your testimony, you point out you point to the basic uh, rights as the operational necessity and fundamental principle of effective intervention. Uh, why does this approach represent the most effective and appropriate way to address root causes of migration like food insecurity? Well, it's important to look at um, at food as a right uh, and as a right that is about how to ensure access to food. One by not blocking that access to food, and and that's something that we face in you know many situations where we work. And and the new UN Security Council Resolution 2417 really puts sort of muscle and teeth behind the issue of ensuring and maintaining access to food in conflict situations, uh, but also ensuring not that people just receive food. It's not about governments having a responsibility to provide free food for the population, but it's about enabling and facilitating people to have the means of production, right. the means of livelihood in order to earn the resources that they need or grow the food that they need in order to live a healthy and productive life. Thank you very much. Um, and why, why, why does focusing um, on the needs and aspirations of people in the region offer the best opportunity to find solutions to address the root causes of migration? I mean, so and how can the United States Congress best support these types of approaches? Well, what what we find is that if you you know if you come to the table with tailor made solutions, you're not going to sufficiently address the root causes. There's a lot of interlinkages between you know what the causes of hunger is, what's driving people to migrate, uh, why people want to stay home and take that very difficult survival step of moving and even going through, you know, uh, very expensive uh, and dangerous routes in order to, to, to migrate. And when you really understand what would help people to stay, feed their families and engage in a way that would provide their children for a better future, then you can design your programs and your interventions in a way that addresses that. And you know, a lot of the programs that also the first panel was talking about that we're engaged in, when you work with communities to help strengthen their livelihoods, climate smart agriculture, how do you grow more with you know water that's less predictable? Um, how do you grow more nutritious foods, but that are also more marketable, higher income crops, rather than the monoculture system that dominates many of these uh, indigenous communities in particular in Latin America and how do you also make sure that when you uh, when you are whether growing or buying food that you're looking at a a diversified diet because that nutritional component that, um, that that Congressman Smith raised is also very key so really understanding these issues gives you the platform for addressing them in a more effective and in a more sustainable way well, thank you. And and uh, again, I think I speak for everybody on this committee when I say that uh, we, we have the highest regard for the World Food Program and for the incredible work that you do uh, in some of the most difficult places in the world. And um, and it's a, you know, a, a real challenge uh, at this point, uh, given the fact that we've seen a, a, a fourfold increase in in hunger. And, um, you know, and as I think you pointed out in your testimony, you know, it, it, it's it, it's it, the challenge is more than just about funding, although that's important. There are other things that that need to be addressed. But uh, anyway, I'm grateful uh, for you being here, and I'm grateful for uh, the work of the WFP. I'm happy now to turn to uh, Chair um, Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your excellent testimony and to the great work of the WFP. Uh, there's a groundswell of support. It has been for years. <clears throat> for your work. Uh, so thank you so very, very much. In your testimony, you did point out uh, that you're currently supporting 2 million people in the uh, dry corridor of Central America. Um, I think the number is 1.7 billion at the cost of. Uh, is that on a yearly basis or multi-year? And are there things that you can't do, uh, but want to do, but there's a shortfall of funds 
uh, that uh, precludes you from doing uh, that work? Well, thank you for the question. Um, so we are currently supporting 2 million people, but the 1.7 billion is what we would require to scale that up from 2 million to 8 million people. Okay. And that's what the situation requires. <clears throat> that would be 1.7 billion over five years in order to scale up those, those programs. And we've seen a quadrupling of hunger in the region. We have the programs in place that have proven successful, the partnerships in place to ensure that we are addressing the needs as expressed by the most vulnerable. And, um, and we would need the resources in order to take our programs to the required scale. Okay. Would you be kind enough to provide to us, um, you know, what the U.S. share potentially could be to, to scale that up, uh, what we need to be working on to, you know, reach those additional 6 million that are, I guess, not being reached today? Um, because obviously you have multiple uh, contributing countries uh, to this. Um, you could provide that to us. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, well, um, the US is by far our largest donor and, and normally we receive about 40% of our resources uh, globally from the US and we're very grateful for that support. While there's some countries that receive an even higher proportion of resources from the, from, from the US. So what portion of that share really depends on, on the financing that's, um, that, that's available? Right now we do benefit from US support in Central America, primarily for our disaster relief program. So we had a, a, a big surge of, of US support last year in, uh, in and earlier this year in addressing the needs associated with ETA and IOTA. What we're hoping for is that the US will get more involved in some of the resilience building, some of the longer term programs that we have in place in, in the region. And, and that's what we're looking for when we're looking at the 1.7 billion. Central America is the backyard of the US. So while some of the resilience and development programs have actually been benefiting from support from the European Union, from Germany, uh, those parts of our work haven't yet benefited from the US support, which is just going through, through other channels at this point in time. And we think there's a real opportunity to scale up, but the scale up is only going to happen if the US steps up their support. Great. If you could provide that to us, it would be, <clears throat> I think, you know, I am asking, I know you usually go through uh, channels right to USAID and to the U.S. government, but, uh, you know, we can play an assisting role. We do, you know, appropriate funding and, and, um, and you know, I give you my word, we will do everything we can to, to assist. But if you could get that, you know, we need the specifics, if you could. We, I would be happy to share that with you, sir. Thank you. I just wanted to, when, when you talked about, you know, what happens after the first thousand days, um, please don't ever take what I'm saying or what that initiative is that somehow we stop. Um, obviously, we want to continue uh, food supplementation and, 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 you know, just all of the efforts to make sure that our children and their mothers are as healthy as humanly possible. But the first thousand days does have a disproportionately positive impact uh, on that child's life. You don't get it back, as you know, cognitively speaking, the loss of, I mean, we've had, I've chaired several hearings on the first thousand uh, days uh, in food security for those mothers and, and their children. <clears throat> and the numbers are overwhelming uh, that in terms of cognitive ability and all the other things, stunting, of course, which is a, another terrible consequence of food insecurity. Uh, you get that window of opportunity Absolutely, it's got to continue. It's almost like, you know, our, our Head Start program here in the United States, which is a great program uh, to help uh, people at or near the poverty line with their children to make sure they get early education, but also nutrition and other kinds of supports so that those kids are ready to learn uh, and, and, uh, and thrive as they get into elementary school and beyond. So uh, I fully agree that, you know, it's not we're done. <laughs> It's that it, you pass the baton for those next several months and years in that child's life. 
Absolutely, Congressman. And just to uh, also emphasize, I, with you, am a true, true believer in the essential importance of the first thousand days. And, and I want to assure you that we are, are, are new, what we call our nutrition specific programs. So the programs that are really targeting mothers and those youngest children with supplementary nutritious uh, foods and products and services working through the health centers in order to do that. For us, those are basically the foundation to a healthy and, and productive life for, uh, for, for children. And I noted your, your question on the, uh, to the previous panel. We do include folic acid as part of the supplementary nutritious foods that we provide to mother and mothers and children through the, uh, through the health center. Well, thank you so very much and thank you for your great work. Yo Beck. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee. No, okay. Well, then, before I let, I let you go, it, it, it might be helpful also for us to know, you know, what are the other countries, uh, what other countries are major donors uh, in Central America? And I ask that just so we know who we might better coordinate with. Well, thank you. And, and, you know, there is no replacement for the U.S. in, right. in, in Central America, that's for sure. Uh, but because of some of the evidence around the success of our programs, we were quite pleased to be able to attract financing from the European Union. And this is normally when we get funding from the European Union, it comes through their humanitarian branch. But in this case, we had sort of rare contributions from their development branch uh, towards our resilience programs because in Central America because they showed quite a lot of promise. So uh, the European Union's development branch and then also Germany, which has globally really stepped up in the past two years as a donor. Germany is now the second uh, largest donor to the World Food Program. Still quite a bit behind the US, but quite a bit ahead of the other uh, right. donors. And so uh, Germany has also provided some support for the programs in the dry corridor and uh, and for Haiti as well. What about Canada? Canada has not been a big donor uh, in in Central America. They've been focusing on on other areas. Well, again, I uh, appreciate you being with us um, and thank you for all the work uh, that you do. And um, uh, to echo my co-chair, I mean, we we certainly want to be supportive of the work that you do and uh and again uh, you're part of the solution to dealing with the issue of making sure that everybody um you know not only has the right to food but can you know but, but to make that a reality that people can get access to uh, to nutritious food and um and that your commitment to resiliency is the other thing that we we care very much uh, about here too so i appreciate you being with us and thank you very much you gotta um, you have to unmute yeah. Sorry. Thank you so much. And your engagement and knowledge uh, on this issue and commitment is is so uplifting for all of us. And I'll pass that on also to David Beasley. Sure. Thank you. My best. Thank you. All the... Now we go to our third and final panel. I want to welcome uh, Victoria Ward, PhD, is Save the Children, uh, Children International's Regional Director for Latin America and the, and the Caribbean, based in Panama. She has over 25 years of experience designing and managing programs in the region including humanitarian and public health programming, rights-based programming for children and youth, and programming for un underserved and indigenous groups. Prior to joining Save the Children, uh, she was a global health consultant and served as director of programs and director of evaluation at the International Planned Parenthood Federation for the Western Hemisphere. Colin Christensen uh, is the global policy director for One Acre Fund, a social enterprise that provides agricultural services more than 1 million smallholder farms. For four years, he has uh, led the fund's government relations department based out of Kigali, um, Rwanda, ensuring close partnerships with governments in the seven countries where the fund works. Since 2019, he has been based in Washington and tasked with helping to ensure that the needs of smallholder farms around the world are addressed comprehensively in policy and funding conversations. Robert Destro, is the former Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, and a professor of law at the Catholic University of America. He served as interim dean of the university's Columbus School of Law from 1999 to 2001. He is a human rights advocate and civil rights attorney 
with expertise in elections, employment, and constitutional law. We are grateful to all of you for being here. Dr. Ward, we will begin with you. Thank you very much. I want to thank Congressman McGovern and Congressman Smith for calling this hearing and giving Save the Children the opportunity to testify about this issue that affects the lives of millions of children and their families in Central America. Like the Congressman, I was uh, I started my career in Guatemala and Honduras in the 80s, and so have been watching the, what has happened in this region for the for several decades now. The support of the of USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance has been invaluable in mitigating the impacts of recurrent drought, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and the two back-to-back hurricanes that have been described earlier. Save the Children addresses the root causes of migration and communities of origin, as well as the humanitarian needs of migrants and other highly vulnerable populations in Central America. One of the most effective ways that we fight hunger and child malnutrition in the region is through targeted cash transfer assistance to the most vulnerable families, usually combined with nutritional counseling based on the first thousand days principles that was mentioned by Congressman Smith. Evidence has repeatedly shown that this is a modality of choice for addressing food insecurity and other humanitarian needs during recurrent droughts and emergencies, as well as in development settings. In emergency contexts, multi-purpose cash transfers through debit cards or cash vouchers that can be redeemed at stores enable families to obtain food and support local markets and farmers. Cash transfers are used to purchase essential food, medicines, livestock, and seeds for future crops. Evaluation of a recent USAID funded Save the Children project revealed that the prevalence of moderate to severe hunger was reduced by 60% in targeted communities after cash transfer programming. In one recent example of the impact of cash vouchers, a young mother in Nicaragua whose community was ravaged by hurricanes Eta and Iota told us how our cash voucher program enabled her to buy much needed food for her two children, while nutritional supplementation helped lift her underweight daughter out of the acute malnutrition danger zone. This young woman, like so many in the region, was already in an extremely precarious situation due to the price increases related to COVID lockdowns when the hurricanes hit. In development programs, cash transfers are combined with livelihood strengthening to increase the income and earning potential of families while simultaneously providing information to influence household investment decisions. Generously, our programs in these uh, cash transfer programs provide funding to mothers and to female heads of households, a, a question I know that uh, Congressman McGovern is very interested in. In a six-year project funded by USAID's Food for Peace program that included cash transfers along with livelihoods development, water and sanitation, and other proven interventions, rates of poverty and child malnutrition in Guatemala improved dramatically. The final evaluation showed a significant reduction of 29 percentage points in the prevalence of poverty. And in this region, poverty means living on less than $1.25 a day. The percentage of children receiving a minimum acceptable diet more than doubled from 22 to 47 percent. And these kinds of programs um, while this while this program predates the current crisis, we know that many of the gains that were have been made in programs like this have been lost in the pandemic. Our food security and livelihoods programming is integrated with other interventions designed to address children's rights, strengthen gender equality, protect children from violence, improve nutrition, and improve and provide economic empowerment for adolescents and young people. 
important to note that the limited access either due to displacement or prolonged COVID related school closures exacerbates the crisis of food security as, as it, and is in itself an emergency. In the region, most children are still totally or partially out of school and many will drop out permanently due to the need to work. Save the Children has been able to adapt school feeding programs funded by the McGovern Dole International Food for Education Program in partnership with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. However, these critical programs are most successful when schools are open. Functioning secondary schools are also vital to youth livelihoods development, work which is an important complement to food security initiatives. These programs ensure that adolescents and youth learn civics and responsibility as well as solid skills and can contribute effectively to society rather than joining gangs or falling into the hands of tra traffickers or coyotes who promise them passage to the U.S. Save the Children also works to provide technical assistance and policy advice to national governments on child and gender sensitive social protection programs to institutionalize longer term cash transfers designed to lift children out of poverty and to ensure that they also have the means to attend school. Save the Children urges Congress and the administration to strengthen support for economic empowerment for adolescents and youth. This, along with the creation of protective environments, including access to schooling, are important investments and should accompany food security interventions in order to create lasting change. Child sensitive social safety nets that alleviate poverty provide incentives for continued education and programming that is protective of children are vital longer term investments. It is critical that Congress show bipartisan leadership in support of strong humanitarian assistance and integrated development programs designed to address root causes. In light of the recurring and layered crises that the people of Central America are facing, life-saving humanitarian assistance coupled with smart development programming has never been more important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Christensen. Yes, uh, thank you, Co-Chairman McGovern, uh, Co-Chairman Smith, and distinguished members of this commission. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to speak on this really critical topic of food insecurity in Central America. I'm here representing One Acre Fund, a social enterprise that provides agricultural services to more than a million smallholder farmers. I also serve as the co-chair of the Advocacy Committee at the Alliance to End Hunger, a diverse coalition of U.S. institutions working to build the public and political will to end hunger in the U.S. and around the world. Alliance members, including One Acre Fund, have been raising the alarm about the growing hunger crisis in Central America, and we are truly grateful for this committee's attention to this problem. With a focus on smallholder farmers, U.S. development support can build a lasting, sustainable path out of this perennial challenge. I'm going to address the market failings that underpin this crisis and new tools that could empower farmers to grow their own way to prosperity in their own communities and not feel compelled to migrate. Smallholder farmers make up about three quarters of all farmers in Central America, often working with just a few acres of land and with upwards of 75% living below the poverty line. Most still eat much of what they grow. One FAO report found that in Guatemala, smallholders only sell about a third of their crops. And hunger remains a challenge in many of these communities. As Ms. Guar Guarniari discussed in the last panel, more than 8 million people across Central America face acute food insecurity. And as she spelled out, climate change is making the food insecurity problem worse. Humanitarian food aid is absolutely essential to mitigating acute hunger needs, and I'm privileged today to present alongside my co-witnesses who can speak with such fluency to this critical work. However, we must also acknowledge and address the system-wide failings at the heart of rural underdevelopment that trap smallholder farmers in endless cycles of low yields and exclude them from functioning markets. There are a number of salient issues. Rural populations in the region have limited access to financing. Few banks are lending to them. Rural populations face infrastructure deficits. Many of the feeder ro roads that exist are littered with dirt mounds and potholes. 
A trip from Choluteca to San Pedro Sula, Honduras should take five hours, but due to poor road conditions actually takes 13. And they are still largely excluded from the information they need to maximize the efficiency of their farms. Less than 2% of smallholder households in Guatemala have access to government extension services. Smallholders' inability, especially female smallholders, to access these services is ultimately a governmental failure to provide reliable markets. In fact, we would argue that the US government's own investments in building functional agricultural markets, both at home and abroad, has helped to establish a governmental market maintenance as a global norm. For example, Title VI of the Farm Bill provides economic development assistance to rural Americans, helping communities with few economic connections become integrated into the international agricultural market in our own country. And Title XI builds support for crop insurance markets, ensuring that American farmers and families and their communities don't go hungry when crops fail. And internationally, Title III of the 2018 Farm Bill supports the Market Access Program, Food for Progress, the McGovern Dole Program that we've been discussing today, all of which seek to provide reliable agricultural markets for smallholders and access to nutritious foods. And through the Global Food Security Act, the U.S. actually requires partner governments to show a commitment to agricultural investment and policy reform to be selected as a target country. However, governments in Central America are struggling to meet this same responsibility. Providing reliable markets does not have to be a responsibility they bear on their own. As we look to solutions, we encourage this committee to consider the role of social enterprises as a still largely underutilized tool, currently just receiving a tiny portion of development support and financing that can be engaged as partners with governments to create more sustainable systems change. As mission-driven organizations, social enterprises commit themselves to advancing public goods like improving smallholder livelihoods. However, unlike a typical NGO, they work more like a business, earning revenue from beneficiaries, thus reducing the need for donor funding over the long term. They also bring a unique perspective into why rural markets are failing. By selling products and services, social enterprises are accountable to the clients they serve. If a customer does not value it, he or she won't buy it. One Acre Fund has extensive experiencing, experience providing products and services to smallholder farmers in Africa. And there are several social enterprises serving farmers in Central America. For example, in five years, Acceso has built one of the leading smallholder supply chains in El Salvador providing holistic support to 3,000 farmers, farm workers, and fishers, selling inputs, seedlings, and fingerlings to them, constructing the country's premier aggregation and processing center for domestic and export products, thanks to its partnership with USAID Feed the Future, and becoming a leading provider to some of the biggest food, food buyers in El Salvador, including supermarkets and restaurants. Social enterprises like Acceso and One Acre Fund can help invest in and catalyze the transformation of markets. They can prove the long-term social and commercial value of serving excluded populations in ways that are scalable and commercially sustainable. However, no path to scale up is purely commercial. The path to a fully functional market where both smallholders and companies can profit requires complementary investment and policy decisions from governments. Taxes and tariffs have to be set to incentivize local production. Roads and processing facilities must be built. Security must be provided so farmers don't face extortion. Credit models should be built to provide more nimble financial products. And the rule of law must ensure transparency from all companies, officials, and individuals profiting in the system. The U.S. government, through our own domestic legislation supporting our own farmers and our own international development assistance, has established an important norm around the responsibility of governments to build functional agricultural markets, to catalyze a shared risk approach to building supportive ecosystems for commerce, trade, and inclusive economic development, and to ensure especially that the most vulnerable excluded farmers, especially women and minorities, have the tools they need to prosper. We strongly encourage this committee to explore how social enterprises can help governments in Central America meet this responsibility. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Destro. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Co-Chairman, Mr. McGovern. Thank you, Mr. Smith, uh, for having invited me today. And uh, I am uh, honored to be here, honored to join my uh, fellow panelists on the, uh, the first two panel and this panel and to share my experience as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Uh, you have my prepared statement, so I'm not gonna really burden the record today with, by repeating any of that. What I wanna do is start with the last question that I raised in that written testimony, which is how useful is it to somebody like me who was actually unlike everybody else who really testified, you know, I actually represented the United States government. So I was authorized not only to, to speak to my foreign counterparts, but also to answer questions about what we're doing, to answer questions by NGOs, uh, who, uh, all of whom today have made absolutely excellent, uh, uh, excellent uh, suggestions. And, um, and, you know, so the question for me that I raise is just how helpful is it uh, to use a rights framework uh, when we talk about food insecurity. And, uh, and I guess the, the short answer to that question is that it's actually most useful when we start talking about concrete solutions on the ground, uh, not when we're making the case that there's a need. I don't think that there's anybody on this panel or any, on any of the panels who disagrees uh, that food insecurity is a very serious problem. It's a growing problem around the world, uh, not just in Central America, but also in uh, relatively developed, you know, developed countries like uh, uh, and uh, middle development countries like South Africa. So we are. Uh, so the 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 question here is, you know, from my person, what have I learned that I can share with the committee? Uh, that will help you in your deliberations. And, and the first thing I can tell you is that when I'm on the phone or when I was on the phone with a counterpart, whether it was from Central America or any other part of the world, the first question was almost always, uh, what is it exactly that you want? You know, and, and we were looking at the question of what's the agenda of the foreign government? What do they want from us? And, and you know, the, the opposite question, what do we want from them? And so the, uh, from my perspective, the first and most important goal of every one of those conversations was to move the dialogue towards some kind of a measurable concrete outcome. Sometimes it was really minimal, like just to have another conversation about the topic, especially if it's a neuralgic one, like uh, food insecurity or, or corruption that, that aids, aids it. Sometimes it's to achieve a very specific outcome like the release of a prisoner. But other times, and, and most times really, uh, from my perspective as Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights and Law Labor, it was really policy oriented to get another government to address structural problems that create food insecurity, such as the drug trade, corruption and organized criminal violence that makes it uh, difficult, if not impossible, for farmers to get their uh, to get their their crops to uh, to market. So the the um, the question here is, from the perspective of the U.S. government, the the assistant secretary, you know, will not be speaking in rights language uh, to to the people inside the State Department. We're already on the same page. It says what we will do, what I would do, is turn to the professionals who actually operationalize our foreign policy and ask a very specific question. What tools do we have on the ground in Central America to make things change? What are we spending? What governmental units, with what governmental units are we engaged on the ground? Which international organizations like the World Food Program are engaged? With whom and with what tools? What are we doing as a whole of government, uh, uh, on a whole of government basis to affect the problem of food insecurity in Central America? So this means USAID, state, justice, defense, agriculture, you name it, uh, across the board. And if you want to see uh, some examples of that, I invite you to, to look at the uh, State Department's website, foreignassistance.gov, 
which will give you a sense of what money is being spent. It doesn't tell you where, uh, but it tells you on what. And then most importantly, what are we getting for the resources, both human and financial, that we're investing on the ground? And, uh, and, and that raises probably one of the most difficult and important uh, lessons that I can share with you. And that is that from my perspective, money does not follow foreign policy. Money is foreign policy. And from the perspective of the members of the House of Representatives who have the first responsibility for fiscal oversight uh, in the Congress, you know, we, you need to demand from our government, from people like me when I was in the State Department, come in here, explain what we're spending, what, in what sectors, and what results are we getting. That result is, you know, that reporting requirement is built in to the foundation of Evidence-Based Policy Act, uh, which was passed in 20, adopted in 2019, Public Law 115-435. You know, and, and once we have a sense for whether things are working or not, then we can maneuver those tools and use the rights framework within the UDHR to make the case for why they need to, the governments need to get these obstacles out of the way. I think that uh, uh, Mr. Christensen did a spectacular job in talking about how, you know, the government needs to have the rule of law. You know, they need to have an infrastructure. The other speakers spoke eloquently about the nature of the problem and the barriers that people face. You know, from the perspective of a US government employee as an assistant secretary, talking to another government. I have to say, here's what we are doing. And if they come back to me and say, it's not working, you know, or we need more, then we need to have a discussion. And the members of your committee commission are key members in that, key participants in that discussion. And, uh, and so what, we, uh, what I would respectfully urge the commission in closing is to look very specifically at what we got for the 563 million uh, that we spent directly on food security in Central America since, since 2015. If we look at uh, one of the countries that came up, I'm um, looking at through the uh, foreignassistance.gov, 103 million for Guatemala in the last fiscal year, Nicaragua 27.7, El Salvador 84, Honduras 70.8, and Haiti, which came up during the, the, the uh, question and answer period, $268.1 million in the last fiscal year. My question, honestly, to you is what do we get for the money? And is it moving the ball forward? Uh, I will thank you again for the opportunity to, uh, to participate in the hearing. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Let me ask Mr. Smith, I, I don't know what you're time is like, whether you want me to go first or whether you're, um, you, you prefer, it's up to you. No, no, go first, that's fine. Okay, all right, yeah. I'm so fine. Let, okay, let me, let me begin, uh, first of all, thank you all for y your testimony. And, um, and let me just say at the outset, you know, when I think of this issue, I, um, uh, you know, I, I think the rights framework is actually very important uh, because, uh, you know, hunger is essentially a political condition. In many respects, I mean, I mean, we have food. Uh, the, certainly, the world has the resources. We have the ability to actually solve this, but it's not happening. We heard from uh, the uh, um, uh, Ms. Guarneri at the World Food Program how hunger has increased fourfold, um, and so I think it is helpful to be able to ask governments. You know, um, are they are they um, you know, are they doing what they said they were going to do? I mean, uh, in Central America, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have um, a, a number of the countries have all ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and the San Sal Salvador uh, Protocol uh, to the American Convention on Human Rights, which, you know, basically calls for, uh, you know, a number of things. I mean, in, in basically recognizing that food is a fundamental human right and 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 compelling governments to make food available 
make sure it's safe, it satisfies dietary needs, it's culturally acceptable, it's economically and physically acceptable. Um, you know, we don't even guarantee food in the United States uh, to everybody. I mean, we have a hunger problem in the United States. Uh, there are different degrees of, of, of hunger, but the bottom line is that hunger is a solvable problem. Um, and, you know, and, and there are all kinds of roadblocks that are put in the way. I mean, we talked earlier about corruption. We, 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 uh, we talk about, you know, again, the, um, uh, the difficulty of getting access to certain people. Um, you know, um, but I do think that uh, we need to ask is each government, and we're talking about Central America, is each government addressing all the aspects of what they said they would do? I mean, I think we have to hold governments accountable. Um, you know, you, 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 you ratify a protocol, you ratify a, an agreement. I mean, I think that's not a, a, an unreasonable thing. And I even think in the United States, quite frankly, um, this issue needs to be more of a priority um, uh, and more of a, of a focus than it has been even now. I mean, I, I, I think addressing the issues of hunger and nutrition, you know, should be, you know, upfront in terms of what our foreign policy is. It's a huge problem with all kinds of ramifications. Um, so, uh, let me, let me just ask a, a few questions here. Um, you know, Mr. Christensen, I mean, you know, what specifically distinguishes, distinguishes the social enterprise approach to addressing food insecurity from other strategies. How or why might social enterprises be better equipped to address um, systematic and cyclical patterns of food insecurity? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Co-Chair uh, McGovern. That is, that is a critical question. Um, I mean, I think the main way that social enterprises the main sort of value they add to sort of development toolkit of the US is that they can think in the long term. I think the way we think about development now is, you know, we run sort of time limited development projects that last for a couple of years, um, but they don't sort of leave much infrastructure on the ground. And they can certainly play critical roles in solving, you know, acute problems and, and helping um, populations with specific needs, like many of, of the co-witnesses spoke about. But I think ultimately, if you want to fix these markets, you know, you need to think in terms of decades, not in terms of, you know, just a few years. And I think in those time limited projects that, you know, we currently run, they're all based on sort of activity plans that are, you know, created, you know, at the beginning of a project far away from the field. It doesn't allow for a nimbleness. And I think the strength of social enterprises is that, you know, they are inherently nimble. They are based in the field. They are accountable to clients and they can respond to market forces uh, and they can change. But I don't think we have a way of, of, of supporting them right now that, that, that allows them to be nimble because I think we think, we think in such a time limited and fixed way in how we do development. Uh, Dr. Ward, um, can you expand on how Save the Children has adapted their school feeding programs funded by McGovern Dole during the pandemic? Certainly. Um, thank you for that question, uh, Congressman. In fact, what we did in many instances, one, we used uh, cell phones to contact families um, in places where they could not, um, could not uh, access schools and were no longer going to school. And in Guatemala, for instance, we also advocated with the government to allow the school feeding program to be moved out into the community. So we gave those same families the, the food they would have received at the school. We gave them uh, to the family directly the, and contacted those families via cell phones where possible and via local leaders, uh, community leaders who we work with. It was um, a, an effort of advocating with the national government and working at the community level to ensure that we could give. Sure. I yield. Am I having internet? I'm having yeah, some we, internet we, we, difficulties. Yeah, we, we, Were you we, able we, to we, hear we, me? We, we heard some of you, but we didn't hear the second part of it. Um, so, um, okay, 
so it's basically a two pronged effort with the uh, advocating with the national government to allow us to change the program and also ensuring that families were able to pick up the food for their children um, at the uh, at places in their own community. Right. And can you uh, and, and why are child sensitive social uh, and why are child sensitive social safety nets that integrate education critical for long term investments in Central American youth? Well, as we've all been discussing, these problems that we see in terms of food security and other issues, uh, other social issues, are of longstanding, or, uh, longstanding origin, and we think it's it really is time to ensure that governments take responsibility and that civil society actors and um, uh, and go other governments hold governments accountable, and part of that is is using evidence based um, uh, programs like uh, conditional cash transfers that have been used very effectively to ensure that people pr provide education for their children and have the funding to be able to get their children into school or to get uh, access health services. Uh, are institutionalized within those government programs and are ways in which that they they can continually assist children and ensure that they are able to have the the right exercise their right to health and to education. Right, and and Mr. Christensen, I know you've also done some work in Africa. Um, uh, can you share with us? Are there are there lessons across regions for us to? To, to learn here? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yes, uh, One Acre Fund works um, works across East and Southern Africa with, with about a million farmers, actually. And yes, there are many lessons. I think that, um, I mean, the big lesson is just that if you get these tools to smallholders, they, they're empowered, you know, they, they, you know, they are able to, you know, repay their loans. I mean, in One Acre Fund, you know, 98, 99% of our of the farmers we work with repay their, you know, $70 loans to us. Um, because if you get them these productive assets, you get them the fertilizer and the seed, um, you know, inherently, you know, they're able to make a living. Um, they just don't have access to those. Right. And so I think the 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 potential is there for the market. But I think what we see in the place in where we work or where an excesso works in El, in El Salvador. Is the is the private sector is not stepping into that space on its own because there's too much risk. The the path to profit is too long is too far in the future, and so what we're seeing if we take where we work in Kenya, over years. I mean, we've been working in Kenya 15 years, and you start seeing that market develop, and you see the competition, and you you see that change. But you need you know you need to be there for the long term, in partnership with farmers to see that. Right. I mean, as a question of all of you, I mean, um, you know, um, in one way or another, you've all been working on hunger and food security for a while, um, in some cases for a very long time. Um, but based on your experience, what are the biggest obstacles or challenges to substantial into substantially reducing hunger and improving food security in Central America at this point? You know, what what needs greater attention? Um, and, um, you know, I, we could begin uh, with whoever wants to begin can begin, but I want all three of you to be able to answer that if you could. Mr. McGovern, I, uh, yeah. if it's okay, I'll start. Uh, absolutely. I'm, you're, you're, this is like Hollywood squares and I, and I can't, you're all, <laughs> every time someone speaks, you move. And so, um, but I, anyway, so Mr. Destro, why don't you begin? Okay. Uh, you know, from the perspective of a government official. You know, it really is uh, to have a really serious uh, evaluation done of how effective our programs are. I mean, you know, every every day in my capacity as assistant secretary, I was signing big checks. Uh, you know, the the DRL budget is is about one and a half billion dollars worth of foreign assistance. You know, very little of which goes to hunger. That's uh, that's other parts of the State Department and USAID. But I never really had a good sense and was never able to get a really good sense of how just how effective these programs are. And I think that uh, a an oversight hearing on what are we getting for the money would be very, very helpful to the people in the Biden State Department in, uh, you know, the, the staff might not like it. You know, but the fact of the matter is we do need to know whether or not we're spending money in the right places. These are not just social welfare programs. 
what we want to do is move policy and get those obstacles out of the way. And the human rights discourse is particularly helpful. You know, when you're talking about can, you know, do, do farmers have the freedom to farm and, and the ability to get their produce to market? Otherwise, you know, if you're only talking about the demand side, which is what oftentimes the, the debate talks about, you got to also talk about the supply side, the supply chains, the slavery, you know, all that stuff that goes on in, in, in this space as well. Okay, thank you. Mr. Christensen? Yeah, um, I mean, I think if you're looking specifically at the Central American countries, I think a unique challenge there is rule of law and transparency. Right. Markets that do exist, they're captured in that region by, you know, large family businesses. They're not, you know, they're not efficient in the sense that they're not serving the general population. And a country like El Salvador is thus a net food importer, despite most of its land being arable. Um, so I think that really focusing on how to make those markets fair and beneficial for everybody um, is a key policy goal. And I would say just to echo Mr. Destro's point from the U.S. You know, point of view in Central America, but frankly everywhere, definitely this focus on outcomes is important. I think we think so much about inputs and activities and how we do development, but how do we measure those outcomes? You know, how is this all leading to actual changes in income? in a rigorous way where we can actually know what's attributable to the to our work, not just some survey that tells us that farmers are happy. So I think, you know, how we measure outcomes better as, as, as the U.S. is key, and then how we help those regional governments really build the rule of law. Dr. Ward. Thank you for that question. Um, I agree with both of, uh, of the colleagues uh, in terms of the need to evaluate what has worked. I cited a couple of examples of uh, USAID funded uh, programming that we have seen was able to lift children out of uh, out of poverty. We also are are very much uh, in, in the opinion that the child safe child sensitive social protection initiatives will work, and those have been evaluated in other parts of the world, in Africa and Asia and have seen to be an effective way to ensure that children are lifted out of poverty. And we can share information and data with the, this committee, if you would like, on the effectiveness of those kinds of programs. I, I think that the issue of governance and lack of transparency is obviously a, an extremely important issue in Central America. One of the approaches that we think, in addition to governments holding those governments accountable, are really working with civil society actors to ensure that they themselves are holding the governments accountable. I, we think that both adult civil society and young people who are learning how to be responsible citizens and to exercise their rights and their civic responsibilities can help to hold uh, uh, governments accountable and that that would be uh, working on that sort of civil society strengthening is a very important initiative to try to create lasting change. Yeah, and let, and let me and let me just conclude before I yield to uh, my colleague, Mr. Smith. Um, when we talk, when I when I speak about a right to food, I'm not, it is not simply handing people food. Um, it is creating a, a, a climate, a system where people can get access to food. Um, and so it's not just the demand, it's also the supply, you know, you know, I chair the rules committee, I've been focused on domestic hunger issues for a long, long time. We have kind of turned the rules committee into what we, the old select committee on nutrition and human needs, trying to look at hunger in the United States more holistically. So it's not just about SNAP. And by the way, you know, when people criticize the SNAP program, I remind them that the majority of people on the program who can work actually do work, but their wages are so low. So wages are a part of solving hunger. Um, you know, it is also actually where you live. You live in a in an area where you know there's no supermarkets or grocery stores. You live in what we call food apartheid, you know, where you don't have access to nutritious food. Uh, and by the way, one of the reasons why supermarkets don't go to a lot of these poor neighborhoods is because you know they don't make a lot of money. Um, and or some of the neighborhoods, like in the Bronx, I visited one a. A, a what they call a food. I don't like to use the word food desert because desert's a natural thing. Um, this is an, this is an intentional situation where there are not 
uh, grocery stores. Uh, it is because the price, the rents are so exorbitantly high that it's it's better, you know, it's easier for McDonald's or a, or a Wendy's to go there than, than, than a supermarket. But we need to address that. Uh, we need to address, you know, the the lack of uh, of, of education, uh, the lack of our education system to, to to introduce concepts of nutrition um, and agriculture uh, into their system. Our healthcare system is devoid uh, of nutrition and food. I can write you out a prescription for an expensive drug if you have high blood pressure, but I can't help you get access to good food. Um, so, you know, it, th this is not about handing people ha handouts to people. This is about looking at this from top to bottom, from every which way, creating, you know, a condition where these, where, where all of us, but in Central America, where countries actually signed up and, you know, and pledged and ratified agreements to guarantee right down for them to do that, to think holistically, to connect all the dots. So I just want to be clear uh, that uh, when we talk about right to food, it's not like, oh, you just, it's just, I want to hand you something out. That, that's, I mean, and, and I think that, um, Nations are failing. I even think our own government is failing uh, in terms of how we deal with nutrition and food security. Uh, but um, but I think you know some of the things that have been talked about here today, you know, are instructive and I think are very helpful. Uh, and we have to figure out, you know, it, to the extent that corruption, for example, is a problem, how we how we deal with that. But it's not just there's a whole bunch of things. That need to be looked at and again i go back to what i said before this hunger is a political condition you know it is it, it, if it was a priority um and you know if it was a top of the list we'd be doing things a little bit different differently and i just the final final thing is that you know i don't know about every single government program whether it's been audited or, or whatever i do know about mcgovern dole uh and i do know there's lots and lots and lots of data about not only the cost effectiveness uh, but how it has, um, you know, brought more kids into schools, how it has fed more children, more girls into schools, and also, you know, how these programs have graduated out of being reliant on U.S. support to become more sustainable. Um, and I think so those are all the things that need to be, you know, factored in here. So I, I thank you very much. I'm happy to yield to my colleague, Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, just a couple of points. Uh, as you did raise it again about the right to food, uh, it does come down to definitions, and I think we have to be very clear about how we define it. Uh, my first trip to the Soviet Union was in 1982, uh, uh, January of 82, on behalf of Soviet Jews. While I was there, it was 10 days, um, Moscow and Leningrad, there were a number of Soviet officials, and they badgered our small delegation, and Jim Shannon was part of that delegation from your state, you might recall, and Sam Gaginson, and we went with the National Conference of Soviet Jewry, uh, and they would bring up, and every subsequent trip to the Soviet Union, they would bring up uh, the rights uh, to a home uh, that they supposedly were taking care of, and that we had a homeless problem. They would bring up food. They would bring up issues that governments, however um, uh, empathetic they are to the least of our brethren, and that is my favorite scripture that drives me. Uh, on all humanitarian and human rights work, Matthew 25, and I mentioned it earlier, when I was hungry, uh, did you feed me? Uh, it even drives me on why I stand up for the unborn child uh, from abortion. So I mentioned this because they kept saying that, and we said, no, rights of religion, freedom, the freedom to emigrate. There's no freedom to immigrate, but there is a freedom to emigrate. There's an obligation, and I'm very strongly in favor of it, of uh, when people are true refugees escaping well-founded fear of persecution, uh, that we open up our doors as widely as we possibly can. But the freedom to emigrate is, is a fundamental human right and speech and religion, like I said, and these others. Uh, so they would hit us over and over again on homelessness. Mitch, Mitch um, Schneider uh, was, was a household name among the leaders that we would meet with uh, who would say, look what's going on right there in the District of Columbia. And it was horrible. Uh, and we needed shelters and, and, and an attempt. I actually wrote a law called the Homeless Veterans Assistance Act of 2001. Uh, when I wrote it, it became law. Uh, it was my bill. Uh, I had a series of hearings about our, our veterans who were out on the streets, and it was about 295,000 on any given night. Now it's down to 35,000, still unconscionably high, but it's, it's come down significantly uh, from where it was. 
To me, that's not a right. It's a matter of a moral obligation of a government to say, how can we help the weakest and the most vulnerable uh, every place we find a weak or vulnerable person or persons? And, uh, and that's where hunger, in my opinion, comes in. We, the human rights part of it uh, is, you know, with regards to, and there's a corruption part. Uh, and uh, so we, we, we civilly and, and amicably disagree because I do think if you say it's a, it's a right, I know you said, you know, you don't define it that someone says, I want food and I get it. But, you know, it's the private sector that prov produces our food. It's not the public sector. Uh, the private sector, the farmers, I mean, they, they may get some subsidies for this or that. But at the end of the day, at least in this country and many others, uh, it is the private sector. And they work on incentives, profit margins, and profit motive. Uh, and thankfully, they outproduce anyone in the world. And we get where we are in terms of having sufficient food, but not sufficient distribution, certainly. Uh, as you pointed out, when you and I absolutely agree on, on the importance of food stamps and all the other uh, you know, protections that we have in this country. So I just, and maybe, um, you know, um, the assistant, former assistant secretary of, of democracy, human rights, want to speak to that. Let me also just um, um, mention, you know, the Global Food Security Act, which I was a sponsor of, uh, and, and I mentioned it was a totally bipartisan bill. Uh, we worked with Dr. Shah, the former USAID administrator under the Obama administration. He sat four feet from me right here in this room and and we worked with him and he helped write that in a very very powerful way and it became law uh and he was very keen on making sure there was accountability uh which some of our, our, our uh, folks have spoken to dr ward thank you for mentioning the first thousand days because i i do think it is absolutely transformational groups like gain gin and others have done great uh, you know uh, work in chronicling how much of a gain is made in the life of a child and equally really in the life of the mom uh, that she is food secure uh, during that pregnancy and after as well. So uh, thank you for mentioning that. Um, I would, you know, if anyone would want to speak to the issues of some of which I raised before, one of them especially, and that's the impact of CAFTA, uh, the Central American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, and because again, my concern on that trade agreement, frankly, was what will it do to the small farmer? Will they just be completely enveloped by the larger farms and they're both domestic? Will the U.S. have a capability to export so much that they're left uh, uh, out from being self-sustaining? Uh, what happened there with regards to uh, food insecurity in Central America because of CAFTA? Well, if I can uh, briefly address the question you just raised, Mr. Smith. The, uh, the, the issue of trade, uh, you know, bilateral and multilateral trade agreements like the WTO and, and regional trade agreements is a big topic of discussion in the human rights literature. Uh, for exactly the point, uh, I'm sorry for the, uh, the phone in the background, but the, uh, for exactly the point that you just raised, you know, which is, is does it crowd out the small farmer and basically serve to integrate vertically integrate in, into big corporate farms the uh, uh, you know the the ability to actually get your goods to market and and I think inadvertently what we've done is as uh, so we've pri privileged the big producers and and inhibited the small producers so this is kind of the law of unintended consequences uh, the same thing is true by by not enforcing the rule of law, you're making it impossible for smaller people to do business. You know, so and you raised that in your opening statement about the pie on the windowsill, you know, and I might also add, you know, that the cost of food is going up. The South African food riots, you know, were caused by a 30% raise, you know, at least a 30% rise in the cost of food in South Africa, largely caused by inflation which is not caused by individuals and small businesses, it's caused by government. You know, so, so what we need to do is pay attention and get, when I said whole of government, I, I actually mean that. You need the US trade uh, representative, you need the State Department, you need USAID to make sure that we're not working at cross purposes and, uh, and that we actually have a policy. I mean, uh, I can't tell you how many times Foreign government officials said, well, what is your policy? You know, and, and I, the, the honest answer is, I'm not sure that we have one. Thank you, Secretary Destro. 
Thank you. And, and maybe if I could just add to that, uh, co-chair Smith, um, I don't, I don't actually know so much about the ins and outs of, of, of the trade agreements in the region, but I think high level, um, I think one, as we think about smallholders, I do think it's a risk of, of any trade agreement benefiting big, big um, companies at their exclusion. And one of the challenges is, you know, a smallholders need to grow, to grow food into an export market also links to their need to grow food for their family, remembering they're still eating most of what they're growing. And so if they're excluded from the export markets, which means that they can't bring in the capital to buy the inputs necessary for the profitable food, they're not even growing the food their family can eat. So it's not just about their livelihoods, it really is about their food insecurity. So if these trade agreements, if any trade agreement doesn't take into account the need to protect that, that smallholder market and catalyze it, you're gonna see them going hungry as well as remaining poor. And I would just say like programs like McGovern Dole really do help to solve this as they focus on, you know, for example, sourcing that school, that school food from smallholders. So again, I think it's the way that US investment through McGovern Dole and all these other programs can really help to catalyze these markets. Well, thank you, and I yield back. I I was I was going to uh, just mention I don't I I don't feel um, that I should comment on the free trade agreement, but back to the uh, thousand days issue, I did want to reassure you that I know that uh, the programs that we work on with USAID include that concept, and also that a lot of work has been done to ensure that governments in the region are also in, uh, using the thousand days concept. So the early work that you uh, speak of and that you've supported throughout has had a, an impact in the region in ensuring that ministries of health use that concept in their own work. Thank you, Dr. Wood. You back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I, I think it's Ms. Jackson Lee on the line. I just got a note that she was on the line. Let me see if she's, let me just double check before I. Anyway, uh, just one more time, Ms. Jackson Lee there. Um, all right, well, we're gonna assume that we, we lost her. Um, and I know we have votes about to come up, but I, I, wanna, I wanna thank everybody uh, for being here. And I, um, for, to me, you know, the right to food has been uh, defined and elaborated over decades and is in effect globally. Um, and if a country says they recognize that food is a right, and yet they have a lot of hungry people, then they ought to be held to account for that. Um, it's a tool to demand them to do more. And, and the right to food, um, I don't think should have any, I mean, the, I mean, does not mean a, a Soviet style, you know, system. Um, absolutely not. I mean, you, we have lots of countries around the world that are dictatorships that have constitutions that recognize lots of freedoms and they don't pay attention to it. They ought to be held to account. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that hunger is getting worse uh, on this planet. And in Central America in particular, it has been a major driver of migration. Um, and for all the reasons that Mr. Smith articulated and all of you, I mean, you know, I mean, there are, there are programs and there are initiatives that help young children grow up into healthy adults. There are, there are ways that we can deal with this. And, um, and so, um, you know, I think that, uh, I think that, you know, countries have an obligation to, um, you know, to, um, um, you know, to address, to, to, you know, to address these, these issues more holistically and, and more forcefully. And I'm just getting a note, is Sheila Jackson Lee back online? No, I guess I guess not. I, I think we're, I, at some point, I hope we get rid of Zooms. Um, I want to get back to in-person meetings because I think we're all Zoomed out. And for all the hype about how great our technology is, it's not so great all the time. Uh, but any, any further comments that you guys, that anyone has, please send it, send it to us. But we appreciate uh, your time and all your work, and I want to thank my co-chair. And we will uh, this this is this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.